And uh, that was not something that they wanted. Sorry. Well, economics um, has, uh, well, neoliberalism was, was basically uh, predicated on uh, a, a model of the economy that said uh, the economy was efficient on its own without government intervention. That particular proposition, uh, the first welfare theorem of, of economics, was shown by Arrow and De Bruyne to be true only under very restricted conditions. And then uh, Greenwald and I showed that whenever information was in perfect asymmetric or in perfect risk markets, uh, the reason the invisible hand was invisible was it just wasn't there. I found it remarkable that so many people at Chicago, and I mean that generically uh, as a particular school of thought, not there may be somebody, people from here from Chicago, and I know you probably not don't want to get that label, but uh, I'm using that term just as a, a way, uh, a term uh, of art, um, that uh, so many people from Chicago uh, thought that Arrow and DeBru had proved the first fundamental welfare theorem was relevant. And of course, the remarkable thing was that Arrow himself, after he proved the theorem, spent years showing why it was irrelevant, why markets with innovation were not efficient, markets with healthcare were inefficient, um, uh, and so forth. So they got the wrong message out of the model. And then, you know, in my periodic uh, physics talk, I tried to explain to people like Milton Friedman, why markets with imperfect risk markets and imperfect information were not efficient, it was quite remarkable that there was no way of breaking the bear. Uh, I would prove that they were efficient, give a seminar, and he'd say, you're wrong. And I'd say, where did I make a mistake in my proof? And he'd say, you're wrong. And that was, that was the sure conversation uh, that uh, proceeded. But there's another aspect I want to emphasize is that neoliberal policies often were disjoint from even the neoliberal models. And of course, both were disjoint from reality. For instance, as an example, a model said that didn't matter. Uh, but many of the policies, if you listen to, to the policy wonks on the right, they say they focus on debt. They're worried about growing debt. Uh, some models, like RBC, denied the existence of unemployment, which, of course, was the reason that macroeconomics grew as a subdiscipline than in economics. Other versions of the developments of uh, uh, the counterculture to Keynesian uh, blamed the victim. Uh, the new Keynesian model said the problem was wage rigidities. Uh, their answer to the problem of unemployment is to make workers uh, more miserable. Uh, all of these saw explanation for fluctuations in external shocks, uh, but the 2000 and most other downturns uh, suggest that the fluctuations are largely endogenous. It's not surprising, accordingly, that neoliberalism hasn't delivered the result of these set of policies has been lower growth, what growth that did occur went to those at the top. Trade liberalization has enhanced the divides and recent research has shown that the market hasn't responded in the way that the new liberal class model said it would. Financial liberalization led to the deepest downturn in three quarters of a century and not surprisingly, all had um, uh, I can't. No, 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 no. But but I can't move. The, yeah. Okay. The other one. Yeah. As I said, getting, I'm going to use uh, the pandemic and the post-pandemic inflation 
as a way to illustrate some of the uh, key flaws and and uh, uh, the developments of macroeconomics that have come in the last 30 years, but also to show the strengths of standard uh, new, uh, standard Keynesian economics. But the pandemic broadly showed the key role of government uh, in innovation. Where would we be uh, without the government support for mRNA platforms and, and then the actual spending on the vaccines? Um, government played a critical role in addressing public health externalities and actually in sustaining the macro economy. Um, the Keynesian policies worked. Uh, in, in a sense, everyone became a Keynesian. Uh, the, even earlier, the 2008 Great Recession has shown that fiscal multipliers could be very large, and there's been a lot of good econometrics uh, confirming that. And it also showed, as Keynes had argued, the fiscal policy was more important than monetary, again, as 2008. Um, there are many other insights that come from Keynesian economics, particularly as uh, developed further by economists like Godley and Tobin. Uh, monetary policy was shown to be about more than lowering rates. Uh, it was about the availability of, cap, uh, of credit. Uh, in fact, the interest rates and even QE proved largely ruined, uh, as uh, I argued uh, with my colleague Bruce Greenwald. The issue was not just the zero lower bound. What was critical was access to credit. And now even Bernanke uh, agrees a little bit belatedly. Uh, the Fed and the U.S. government did a poor job in thinking deeply about the allocation of credit. Uh, both who should get it and how it should be done. And uh, there was an allegation of this uh, uh, disproportionately to the banks, and they did a particularly poor job, uh, even though they were uh, uh, very strongly uh, rewarded. Now, uh, one aspect of uh, there are several aspects that I want to go into about why uh, this was not a standard macroeconomic shock and why the models that provided the most insight into both what was going on and uh, uh, how to respond had to go beyond the standard aggregate models of the kind that are uh, in DFG or even in the old Keynesian. Uh, and Godley's work actually uh, focusing on sexual issues is, is, is relevant in here. Uh, these were, uh, there was a large sectoral shock. The pandemic hit the service sector more than the good sector. Actually, when you look at it more closely, the shocks leading to the Great Depression and the Great Recession were also sectoral shocks. Uh, they were affecting more the agricultural sector. Um, the important uh, point here is that when there are sectoral shocks, there are large changes in relative prices. In the Great Depression, the price of ag agriculture fell 75%. And when you have large changes in, in uh, relative prices, aggregation doesn't work very well. Aggregation is very nice when relative prices are constant and the uh, uh, standard aggregation theorems uh, apply and you can use ag analysis. But when there are huge relative price changes, as there were in the Great Depression, involving one of the key sectors where large fractions of the population generate their income, you have to pay attention to those sectoral impacts. And you can't use a simple aggregate model. And the data uh, for uh, the great, uh, uh, for the pandemic, though, uh, that it disproportionately affected uh, the service sector. Uh, it was hit much worse uh, than the good sector. Uh, and that's why some people say it, this may be the first service sector uh, economic downturn. The point is, of course, that sectoral shocks require sectoral responses. Um, and that's particularly true as we take into account what uh, uh, I, I, people like Anton Korna refer to as macroeconomic externalities. 
these are the macroeconomic manifestations and the pecuniary externalities in the presence of market imperfections that were explored uh, by Bruce Greenwald and uh, me in our 1986 pa uh, paper, as was the case, and, and uh, this is was of course in the Great Depression. Um, in the absence of strong government intervention of the kind that we had in the pandemic, uh, the weaknesses in the service sector would have been translated into weaknesses in other sectors. Another important issue that has been left out of the I would say the mainstream of macroeconomics, although it's now belatedly coming back in, is there were large distributional issues. Uh, the uh, representative agent model, I, my time isn't up yet, is it? No, okay. <laughs> That's usually happens, the stuff comes up. And, okay, okay. <laughs> okay, okay. okay. Uh, just wanna make sure. Okay. Um, the, the, uh, uh, the representative agent model assumed that distribution didn't matter. And it was really quite remarkable that that, uh, that was the case. But of course, uh, Cambridge economists uh, like Calder emphasized and Joan Robinson emphasized the importance of distribution, that different groups had different marginal propensities to consume and that made a difference to aggregate demand as you shifted dis distribution of income. COVID-19 exposed and exacerbated the inequalities in our society, and uh, that had uh, uh, real consequences. Um, there were uh, large differences in the impacts of assistance uh, given to different groups. The rich saved the money that they got, but the poor spent it. So, uh, and we have, uh, what is remarkable, we have real time, I'll show you in a second, real time data confirming in this. Models that ignore this are leaving out something that is of first order importance. Uh, targeting money on the poor not only protected the most vulnerable, but also uh, made uh, the money more macroeconomically effective. Uh, of course, we could and should have done a better job uh, in targeting the money politics aside, uh, but the failure to target did not have the adverse effects claimed by some, such as Summers, and I'll come back uh, and show that in a few minutes. Uh, so this shows the very different effect on the, uh, of the and pandemic on different groups in the population. Those at the bottom saw their employment plummet much more than those of us who live on Zoom. Um, this is data from, uh, uh, you know, this was uh, one of those wonderful experiments uh, where you can see what happens, the date uh, on spending, the date uh, when the checks went out. And um, we don't have data by individuals, or, uh, but we have data uh, by zip codes. And you can see in rich zip codes, there was very little increase in spending, but in poor zip codes, there was a very large uh, increase in spending. Distribution really did matter. Overall, what we saw was the savings rate for the United States increased enormously. You know, one of the things that is marked to the US is at a very low savings rate. <laughs> By some measures, uh, you know, they've changed the way we measure it in our GDP accounts, but by some measures, we were down to zero or negative. Uh, but in the pandemic, it, it soared. Uh, overall savings soared to over 25%, one quarter, 40%. Not a surprise, given the level of uncertainty. What was really important here was precautionary savings, uh, at least among the rich, among those who could sustain, sustain themselves. Um, and uh, recognizing these differential marginal propensities to consume was important if we were going to decide appropri the appropriate size of the fiscal stimulus required to sustain the economy. Uh, we did give a very big stimulus, over 25% of GDP, but I think given the poor targeting, it was necessary to sustain our economy and we did better 
than almost any other country, certainly any other country that lost a million people to deaths because the pandemic was so poorly managed. Um, and uh, important aspect of this, I'll come to in a second, the higher savings rate helps explain why the fiscal spending did not have the inflationary effects that people like Summers and other critics uh, predicted that it would. Um, so this is a graph that shows the large increase in what is called excess savings, savings that appeared larger than would have been normally predicted given the levels uh, of income. And not only did it increase dramatically, it came down uh, uh, only very slowly and has been only a, a, a little part of, uh, or not, uh, of the inflation, as I'll show in a few minutes. Actually, the excess savings was only partly due to uh, the uh, to to the extra money that went in pe people's pocket, um, there was also a reduction in outlays, the precautionary savings that I referred to uh, earlier in the, that shown in this graph. Um, uh, much of the drawdown in uh, the savings that I, uh, excess savings that I showed in the graph before was actually to pay taxes because of the unusual way that uh, tax treatment that happened in the pandemic, there was less withholding and then that they put money into the savings account and then they, they had to obviously pay their taxes. Um, the, COVID-19 enabled some tests of other hypotheses. Uh, one question was how important were our labor supply effects, uh, in particular the disincentive effects of unemployment insurance. This of course has been a subject of a lot of controversy over the years. And uh, because we had such a large variation in UI programs across the states, and how they interacted with the federal program, we have actually a lot of cross-section variation. And the bottom line of all this research, not that I've done, but a lot of other people have done, is incentive effects were second order. They really didn't matter. But there were worries that large separations of individuals from their firms might have longer run adverse consequences in the labor market. I think these uh, worries prove correct. It's taken a long time for labor force participation to return to more normal levels, which it is now doing. Europe, New Zealand, and others did a much better job in keeping workers attached to firms, keeping the unemployment rate low. In the midst of the early pandemic policy debates, uh, there were many of us that were arguing that we ought to be using the Danish model or the other models that would uh, uh, keep workers attached to their firms, especially important in the United States because so many workers depend on health insurance from their employer. But uh, we failed. And, uh, you know, we had successes uh, in the sense that Trump wanted uh, uh, the whole thing be done by uh, through the uh, uh, rebates to corporations for their um, uh, uh, social security payments. Uh, that would have had no benefits to workers or almost no benefits to workers. So we prevented things from being as bad as they could be. But we didn't succeed in getting what we hoped. I want to begin now talking a little bit about uh, the uh, inflation and why using the uh, Keynesian framework, but one which actually takes into account some sectoral, uh, the importance of sectoral impacts, is provides a better framework. Uh, in fact, I'm going to comment in a, uh, a few minutes uh, that the standard DSG fr uh, frameworks actually provided no help at all in addressing what was a, obviously a very, very big shock to our economy. Um, 
these were unprecedented shocks. Not only were they un sectoral, affecting particular sectors of them, were a macroeconomic shock. They were unprecedented. Uh, and that means uh, there was uncertainty was key that uh, and uncertainty in the Nightian sense that, that it, and the sense that Keynes talked about it. There was no well-defined probability distribution. We didn't have a long, large number of pandemics to look for. I can say the probability that this will last one year is such and two years such. We just had no data. <laughs> And we, there is what is sometimes called deep uncertainty. And people had to behave not as if there was a well-defined probability distribution, but just with this knowledge that they didn't know. And uh, one of the ways people respond is increased precautionary savings. Firms responded by decreasing demand. And that was also predictable, as I'll show you in a minute. From a mathematical point of view, what it says is you can't use uh, the kinds of tools that macroeconomists love to use, stationary stochastic processes. Uh, the distinction, as I said before, between risk and uncertainty was actually was, was crucial. Um, I want to emphasize, though, that even though this was a very idiosyncratic shock, Following on other idiosyncratic shocks, in many ways, not a shock of 9-11 was uh, idiosyncratic. We don't have airplanes running into air, uh, tall buildings in New York very often. Uh, the 2008 crisis was idiosyncratic. Uh, the shock of Trump is idiosyncratic, hopefully. Um, so all these things are, are things that happen once in a lifetime. And uh, there aren't uh, uh, well-defined probability distributions. But I want to emphasize is even though these events were unprecedented, we do know something. We know things like if there is high unemployment, fiscal policy works, or at least it's likely to work. We have a lot of experiments, lots of different circumstances, and we have a, even a theory that helps explain it. We also know that automatic stabilizers can be very effective, that they can get information in about the state of the economy and feed money into the economy to help sustain the economy. So those are examples of things we know. Uh, we do know. The challenge facing policymakers is to identify the idiosyncratic aspects of the shock, to figure out what is transitory and what is permanent, and if transitory, how long effects will last. So uh, an example of uh, a failure here in, in thinking about this from the uh, perspective that I've just put forward is that central banks uh, have been criticized for, not, for acting too slowly. But I think the key failure was not realizing that this inflation was not due to excess aggregate demand. And the policies pretending that it was may have made uh, things, may make things worse. So we have a whole panoply of reasons why the standard macro models uh, are not very helpful. It was a sectoral shock, not a simple aggregate shock with large distributional consequences, meaning that the representing agent model is totally uh, unuseful. With large changes in savings, precautionary savings, uh, it was uncertainty that was driving it, not intertemporal substitution effects. So those were second order, and that's what our students spend all the time uh, studying. Um, with the liquidity effects, credit rationing critical for, for many houses and firms, and, and uh, would have been critical for stakes and localities in the absence of the broader fiscal support. Um, even the hypotheses of, of wage rigidities has to be re-examined. Uh, 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 re Partly because it's a, it was a service sector uh, shock. Uh, shocks in the service sector is not large corporations for the most part. There are some large corporations. There was more wage flexibility in some places. Average wages in some places actually went down, but real wages in general went down. Um, and uh, you know the standard D, 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 DSG model sets would celebrate the lower wages. 
you know, uh, our chairman of the Federal Reserve Board is really cheering on having making workers wor worse off by getting the unemployment rate up. But Keynes said that may make things worse because it may actually reduce aggregate demand and uh, obviously in lower uh, societal well-being. Uh, But there were failures not only uh, on all sides uh, of the policy debate, uh, but I, I want to suggest here that the nature of the failures on one side were quite different from the nature of the failures on the other. Uh, the, uh, uh, there's been a, a, a way of referring to the two sides of the policy debate, uh, one side saying, it's a sectoral shock, uh, it will go away, it's going to be transitory, uh, sometimes referred to as being transitory. And they did make a mistake. I, I was among those. Uh, the key failure was to recognize that uh, the effects would be less transitory than hoped. Um, part of the reason for that failure was uh, they were uh, too confident in the ability of markets. They failed to recognize the lack of resilience of markets. And I'll come back to talk about some of the market failures. So the irony is the people who were optimistic about a quick return were actually more on the side of markets. They thought markets, you know, they're not perfect, but at least they would respond to these, this large shock quickly. And the answer was it didn't. But the other side, I think, was uh, their mistakes were far deeper. They thought the problem was excess aggregate demand. They didn't realize the sectoral nature. They didn't realize that increasing interest rates could make matters worse. They didn't realize the role of market power. And they thought the changes in the underlying macro relations, the Phillips curve and the beverage curve were uh, permanent. Oh. Um, so to think about going beyond the neoliberal response to inflation, one has to understand the underlying uh, drivers. Uh, uh, we have to uh, understand uh, how do we best respond to these disturbances. And what I'm gonna argue is uh, the focus on monetary policy uh, uh, was wrong. Uh, and there are a host of better ways of doing it. So the basic perspective, as I've already said, it was an unprecedented disturbance. Uh, it was hard to predict short-term and long-term consequences. So the underlying hypothesis was that an economy will largely return to prior behavior. We have to think of, you know, are there deep changes? But, uh, uh, you know, normally we, hit, we, we don't think that a getting leaves you afterwards a fundamentally different person. It might. Um, but we have to be open to that possibility. But uh, presumption is uh, we will largely return to the prior behavior. We don't know how long it will take. Um, but all the policies and analysis must be predicated on recognizing the deep uncertainty uh, and uh, asking the question, uh, there are, we're going to make mistakes one way or the other which of the mistakes have worse consequences and longer term consequences and consequences for who? And um, that, that question is the question that we, I think, have not been answering well. So to begin with the underlying drivers, by now you know where uh, I've already spilled the, 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 the main line, uh, it's not ag ag excess aggregate demand, it's a sectoral shock. Uh, and um, it, it's almost obvious, but uh, it's one of those things, it's so obvious that a lot of people haven't seen it. Um, so I'm gonna go through some slides very quickly where we've done some calculations. This is uh, at the Roosevelt Institute, where we actually did what you would have thought anybody who would taken ec one would begin looking at uh, what is aggregate demand? I don't know if you all remember C plus I plus G plus net exports. 
And you know, so this is not high math. This is not uh, uh, advanced economics. But say, well, let's just look at each of those four components. We have to adjust for inflation, and and you know the numbers are always a little bit pre, but we we have standard numbers. And uh, this is uh, the red line is the trend before the pandemic extrapolated to uh, the pandemic. And we see consumption, real consumption went way down, not a surprise, but recovered to only slightly above trend, hardly enough to give in rise to it, the inflation we've seen. And remember, what people like Summer said, they said, oh, the, all this spending is going to cause massive inflation. Why? Because it was going to cause massive consumption. Where did they make a mistake? Very simple. They forgot about precautionary savings. This was unusual and people were responding differently. And so there was no significant excess consumption. But when we look at the other components, things are even uh, 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 clearer. Um, when we add up, and I, because of time, I couldn't go through see uh, uh, all the components, we add them all up together. What we see is that real total real aggregate demand was actually below trend always. So it's hard to believe that it was excess aggregate demand that was the problem. And here are just giving uh, some of the other components. Government expenditure did go up as we were trying to help people from dying. I don't think we think that's a bad thing. Uh, but then it went down and is now uh, below trend. Uh, the real aggregate demand is actually below CBO estimate of potential output. It only exceeded it uh, very. So again, how could this be the source of inflation? Investment in plant equipment is below trend. Uh, residential investment uh, plummeted. Uh, there was a large inventory accumulation. Again, not a sign of excess aggregate demand. And the numbers of investment include these uh, inventory accumulation. Um, and then when we ask the question, it, U.S. had a stronger fiscal stimulus than any other country. Shouldn't that have meant we had more inflation? The answer is no, we didn't have much more inflation than anybody else. And even when we look at that, there were multiple differences in policies, not only higher pandemic spending, but we had much worse labor uh, policies, as I've already mentioned, much worse working conditions and job protections, which would uh, be another factor and poor health policies. So what were the sources of inflation? Well, it was pandemic induced supply side shortages and uh, pandemic induced demand shifts. Um, there were on the supply side interruptions in global supply chains, uh, example, chip shortages. Early on, the single most important component of the increase of inflation was autos. It wasn't like there was a technology shock to autos. Uh, it wasn't like we forgot how to produce cars. Uh, Detroit still knew how to produce cars. What was the problem? They made one mistake, a big mistake. They forgot to order chips. And a modern car requires chips. And the chip factories at the time couldn't respond. But you know, you I I had a, uh, talked to the head of VW, and I talked. You know, you, you, it was obvious that eventually the market would respond. Where are we today? We have a surplus of chips in the world. Uh, car prices have come down, as is predictable. So we had inflation, and now we're having disinflation in automobiles. Demand shifts were important because the great advantages of living in a great city like New York uh, were much less when you couldn't see anybody. 
you know, what's the point of being in the city if you can't see anybody? So a lot of people said they wanted to go up in the Hudson Valley. But as we all know, there are asymmetries in price responses. The shortages had the prices go way up, but the excess supply, half my apartment building was empty, rents came down very slowly. So what does that mean about the measured inflation? It went up. But in fact, uh, just as an aside, uh, it's important to realize that that measured inflation isn't the kind of inflation that people actually feel. Because the way we measure inflation in the CPI is through imputed rents. And a very small, not a very small, uh, about a third of Americans, less than a third of Americans, live in rental housing. And that is not representative of the whole housing market. For the two thirds of Americans who have owned their own homes, the cost of living didn't change at all until the Fed started raising interest rates. So the Fed is causing their cost of living to go up. It wasn't uh, the measured CP, CP, uh, rental uh, rate in the CPI. There were some other aspects uh, that on, the uh, on the source of inflation, one of which I already uh, mentioned, the unexpected lack of resilience of the markets to shock, a consequence of their short-sightedness and in their investment flexibility. But there's also evidence of uh, exercise of market power with price gouging, uh, prices going in sectors and firms with more market power. Research of Mike Consul at the, at the Roosevelt Institute has shown that very clearly. There actually is a theoretical work that uh, I've done with Bruce Greenwell based on earlier work by Ned Phelps and Sidney Weir that predicts greater uncertainty will lead firms to raise prices. Obvious in a customer market where, where, where there are search costs, where if you are firms are always balancing if they raise the price the, their profits go up today but they lose customers because they induce them to search what is the value of those future customers well it goes down if there's greater uncertainty so that leads them to value present more and to raise prices so it's predictable that uh, there should be some aspects of this, but there are other aspects of the exercise of market uh, power. But the increased concentration of markets uh, in the United States has also, also contributed uh, to our problems. The most famous example of that is baby formula. It wasn't like we forgot how to produce baby formula. What was the problem when we had these vast shortages uh, in the midst of the pandemic? It was because one company that produced 50% of the baby formula forgot to that babies like safe formula. They don't want to die. And uh, it didn't have safe health conditions and the FDA shut down. And with half of them in one firm, it obviously caused uh, a shortage. All of these effects were exacerbated by the war. Um, and of course, some inflation was imported, uh, increases in the prices of imported goods. Uh, the good news is the market is finally responding. Inflation uh, is falling. In fact, inflation for the last six months has been an annual rate of just over 2%. I wanna emphasize no reason to be confident that that will continue. It will may go up to three or four percent, but that's not the end of the world. Uh, and and uh, but uh, uh, the cost of, of trying to uh, intervene may be much greater. So uh, this shows. Uh, this is a graph that just shows that the price increases were centered on certain sectors and timing is not related to the gap between aggregate demand and potential output. Uh, uh, the, 
uh, this shows the, the large decline already in uh, 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 the rate of inflation, uh, which is inconsistent with those who use simplistic macro models thinking that the Phillips curve had permanently shifted. Uh, this shows the large increase in markups. Uh, markups have been on a trend upwards, part of the concern about increasing market concentration that's been part of the Biden agenda. But what is very striking is how quickly it increased, that vertical thing, uh, in the pandemic. Um, and not a surprise that has led to an increase in corporate profits. That leads to the question, well, even, even if it's a sectoral shock, shouldn't we be worried about a wage price spiral? Well, the wage adjustments initially focused on sectors with very low wages. In a way, you can think of what was going on was a normalization. And this now seems over. The key issue is how transitory, how permanent is the shift in the Phillips curve and the beverage curve. And uh, there are large transitory effects. Uh, there's been a high level of separation, as I mentioned before. Individuals in new jobs typically have higher rates. And we've already returned a large way towards pre-pandemic patterns. What we can say is that clearly is that wages have not been keeping up with prices. And this is not a sign of a tight labor market. In any case, there's no evidence of out of control wage price spiral. Not a surprise again, because of the limited bargaining power of workers. Um, hopefully wages can and should increase at a pace faster than is in the long run sustainable. Uh, that is going to be necessary if we're going to increase real wages. They've gone down, the share of labor has gone down. Oh, the only way where we can get real wages back up and to get the share of labor back up is to have wages go up faster than prices. Is it inevitable that that will lead to inflation? No. What did I say happened to the curve? The markups went way up. Hopefully that market power won't be sustained. There hasn't been that dramatic change in market structure. It's been some, and there, we need stronger antitrust laws, but there is no reason to believe that there's been a dramatic change in the market structure. And that means as we normalize, market will come down, and that means wages can go up faster than prices. And I don't understand why Powell doesn't understand this unless he really likes the idea that workers should, should suffer. And when one says that, one has to remember that it, not all workers uh, suffer the same. We who are on Zoom don't suffer at all. But minorities, younger minorities, typically have an unemployment rate four times the national average. So if he says he wants to target an unemployment rate of 5%, He's saying he wants to target a youth unemployment on minorities of 20%. Uh, I don't think that's a good thing. So we hear some graphs that just uh, uh, support what I just said. The, the short run correction and low wages uh, in, in like the hospitality sector, um, uh, wages went way up correcting the abnormally low wage, but the rate wage increase has already come markedly down. Uh, uh, and this again shows uh, the salary of uh, private workers, uh, the rate of increase is coming down. Uh, so what is the picture today? Inflation is being tamed, bottlenecks are being resolved. This is inflationary forces are at play in oil and cars as sectoral prices normalize. There are a number of standard models that talk about the importance of inflationary expectations. I've never been very convinced about them. I don't have the time to explain why I think they're not good models, but whether you believe them or not, inflationary expectations have been 
very tame. And I view that as the fact that most people outside of a small group of macroeconomists read what is going on similar to the way I've been reading it. They see sectoral shocks that will be normalized and the economy's inflation rate will come down. It may not come down to two or 3% quickly, but remember that the inflation target of 2% was totally pulled out of the thin air. And even pulling it out of the thin air, there was no statement about how fast you go back to 2%. There are good theoretical arguments saying that when the economy is going through a large sectoral, a, a large structural transformation, as we are in the post pandemic world, higher rates of inflation targeted, you know, higher inflation targets are actually a good thing. And the reason is because of the asymmetry in price adjustment, you, you want to move resources from one sector to another and to get stronger real signals given the, now, the re downward rigidities, relative rigidities, having a faster average rate of inflation actually facilitates resource uh, reallocation. Um, I wanna spend the last few minutes talking about uh, the policy responses. And the first part is why the monetary policy is not the right instrument. Uh, monetary policy is a very blunt instrument. It works to reduce aggregate demand when the problem is aggregate demand. But the problem today is not aggregate demand. So you can reduce inflation even with our sectoral uh, shock if you reduce aggregate demand enough, if you cause a good depression or recession, I can guarantee you we can get inflation down. But the cost is obviously the cure is worse than the disease. But we don't need to do that, uh, as I'll say in a mo moment. The problem is the monetary policy doesn't address the underlying source of the problem. It won't resolve the supply bottlenecks. In fact, uh, it will make uh, matters worse. We could use a broader monetary policy to address the problem. There are some central banks in the world, like uh, Thailand uh, decades ago before it fought, fell in the influence of neoliberalism, where they use credit allocation policies. They said we needed to get more credit for this or for that. Uh, but that's not the way central banks, for the most part, work. The reason that monetary policy may make matters worse is it will discourage investment required to resolve the supply bottlenecks. Um, one of the problems, one of the sources of inflation right now is housing. It's already, already coming down. But if you thought housing is one of the problems, why would you want policy to make there be less housing? And they've been very successful in reducing investment in housing. So they are exacerbating the problem uh, that is uh, evident in the, uh, if there is a problem in housing, they're exacerbating it. Uh, a second reason why they may make matters worse uh, goes back to the customer markets that I mentioned before, where increases not only in uncertainty, but interest rates induce firms to raise prices. And then finally, in some sectors of the economy, like housing, there's evidence that the higher interest rates get passed on, at least in the short run. Monetary policy has other adverse effects. It increases unemployment, hitting hardest the marginalized group with significant hysteresis effects. And globally, it's even more adverse it's a new form of beggar the neighbor policy. The high interest rates in the United States has had the effect of increasing the exchange rate, which means that uh, the cost of importing goods in developing countries and emerging markets has increased, uh, contributing to inflationary pressures there. Um, 
countries that did not have the fiscal stimulus that we had have a weaker economy and the higher interest rates are weakening their economy further. And finally, many of the countries, uh, particularly emerging markets, developing countries had undertake high levels of debt in the pandemic. And uh, we now face a, a global debt crisis. Uh, the, uh, the monetary policy worsened everything by increasing the value of the dollar, uh, higher interest rates, and slower economic growth. There are alternative policies, and these are both mostly fiscal policy, but not only fiscal policy. There are real supply side policies like increasing green energy, increasing food production. One of the areas where prices are up is, is food. But for 50 years, we've been paying our farmers not to produce. It doesn't take a lot of thinking to say, well, maybe we should pay them to produce. If we have a food shortage, and if it isn't self-correcting, I think it is self-correcting, but, but if you thought it was not self-correcting, the right answer is tell farmers to produce. And that's true not only in the United States, but in Europe. Uh, we could increase labor supply if you think that there is an underlying shortage of labor. More than anything else, uh, in paying higher wages, particularly at the bottom, would make a difference, better working conditions, and better child care, family leave policies. Those are policies that have been shown to have significant effects on labor supply, particularly of uh, women. Uh, I said they're mostly fiscal policies, but there are some others. The markups are partly a result of the higher markups of increasing market power and stronger and better enforced antitrust policies might help. Uh, we will have inflation. It won't come down to 2% overnight. And there are some groups whose wages will fall behind. It's already happening. So we need better protective policy. And there's an easy way of doing that. And we could at least partly finance it by windfall profits taxes. And these can actually be designed to discourage price increases. Uh, you know, the oil companies have had tens of billions of dollars of windfall profits, not because they've done anything to be more efficient. Actually, uh, the fact that they get higher pay simply because price goes up, the price of oil goes up is evidence that the standard model doesn't work because they're getting compensated with bonuses for something that is unrelated to any effort, and it actually adds noise to their compensation. So I've always used that for, for years as evidence that the standard compensation package does not, is not uh, an optimal incentive scheme. Uh, the important, one important aspect of the supply side measures and the anti uh, and, and the uh, uh, competition measures is that these will have long-term benefits Regardless of our interpretation of inflation, whether it's demand side or supply side, these would be benefit our economy. Whereas the monetary policy will have long-term costs if that diagnosis, if my diagnosis is correct. Correct. So in conclusion, the big lesson of the COVID-19 and its aftermath is that the insights of basic Keynesian models as amplified in subsequent decades by economists like Cudley and Tobin provide, I think, far more insights into what is going on and how to sustain the economy at near full employment than do models that have become more standard in macroeconomics, whether of the RBC, New Classical, DSGE, MKDSG models. This is especially so of those models that emphasize the role of distribution, sectoral shocks, and impediments to intersectoral mobility emphasize precautionary savings, credit rationing, market power, disequilibrium, and macroeconomic externalities. And going forward, I think this provides a framework for research uh, and thinking about macroeconomics and attempts to integrate 
in a meaningful way, macro and microeconomics. Thank you. So open up for questions. You know, if you, what I will ask you to do is there is a microphone right there so that people and, and can hear too. So if you make a line and I'll say, you know, we'll, we'll catch a few questions, you know, that Professor Stiglitz can sort of, you know, I don't think he has anything to give you to write if you want them. Yeah. But, you know, three or four of the replies and we'll have a, a few of those. You know, I know that at two o'clock you guys have a, a session. So, so we have a few minutes, not a lot, but we have space for a few Question. Okay. So please tell your name also. And, and Robert Robert University of Manitoba in Canada. It's possible to argue that the Federal Reserve's goal here is not irrational. If the rationality is to increase reserve on the unemployed and protect profits and the banks, you know, inflation problems with inflation in terms of their real returns. I wonder what you think about Galbraith's response to this, both the World War II and the 1970s approach to the border, et cetera, where he said, you know, price controls worked. And in order to maintain supply side interests, both a combination of incentives and coercion, which is what he used in World War II, in order to make sure that the supply side worked out and yet there was no inflation. And so Galbraith, 1940s and Galbraith in the 1970s, Anticipated in some ways, capitalism tended to be the great time for crisis, and the solution was stay a strong supply side state policy. I, I think supply side state policies uh, do have a role. I think. Uh, the experience with price controls uh, in the United States, the complexity of our economy, make that very difficult. Uh, the ingenuity and avoiding circumventing uh, price controls, uh, politically, I think it's uh, not uh, not on the cards. Um, we, you, we, we passed uh, decades ago, the Defense Production Act, which gives the federal government uh, the power when there's an emergency, you know, a disturbance, a large disturbance, uh, to use uh, its power to command uh, 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 resources and and tell. And we used it. Uh, we used it. And other countries have similar uh, similar laws. We used it to command auto com uh, companies to produce ventilators in the pandemic. Uh, we use. Uh, we and others have used it for producing masks uh, to accelerate the production of tests and, and, and vaccines. So in the pandemic, it was widely used. I think we should have used it more widely in response to the um, uh, supply shortages uh, caused by uh, the pandemic and the war, particularly for instance, for directing more resources for green energy investment. Uh, it would have uh, helped reduce the uh, infl uh, inflationary pressure. Uh, one more thing, um, the electricity pricing system in Europe uh, focuses on pricing based on marginal costs, which is what standard economics would recommend, but it was a structure that works when things are normal, when the only variation is the consumption between the morning and the night. It works terribly at times of war, and it works terribly if there's a possibility of market manipulation as California, we saw in California. So it was a, a system that was uh, not well designed in the first place, but blew up uh, in uh, in in the context uh, of uh, what we were going through, and Europe has been very slow to reform. Um, an example of the kind of outrage that comes out of, uh, from this is that Norway, a country with high, strong, uh, high, you know large hydroelectric exporter of gas, exporter of oil. Electricity prices went up ninefold. And you can imagine what that does to ordinary households and small firms 
uh, forcing to bankruptcy. So the answer very clearly is in times of war, you can't just use peacetime measures. Oh, I heard from the Institute of Technology and thank you so much for your presentation. My question is, if you were the chairman of the Fed now, then what would you do? And how would you establish the inflation target? And what would this target be? Well, I I would try, <laughs> I would uh, try to say uh, what I just said uh, that that inflation target is not a meaningful number. What our concern is preventing runaway inflation. We can live with inflation two, three, four percent, five percent. We try to keep it limited. We will check to make sure that. There's not an inflationary spiral going on. Uh, we're going to set strong guardrails, but we're going through a, a, a transition and we need more flexibility. And so I would uh, uh, very strongly uh, try to change the framework within which monetary policy is uh, formulated. I'm just having a little bit of trouble understanding your reasoning for what's driving inflation. Uh, I see that like the New York Fed supply chain stress indicator is now like pre COVID levels. Uh, energy prices are falling, used car prices are falling. It seems to me that a lot of supply shocks are faded. And on the demand side of things, I don't think looking at real variables really gives us a good picture of aggregate demand, seeing that it's kind of accounting for productivity as well. Nominal GDP and nominal PCE are still uh, very elevated. Median and trim inflation is still very high. Just this morning, PCE came out, and I think uh, Jason Furman had a tweet showing that like three months, six months, and 12 months uh, for PCE are still annualized at 5%. Uh, monthly is even higher. But and So, yeah, the inflation picture is complex. What I said in my talk is that uh, inflation is not going to come down right away. Uh, that there is, it has shifted into core, um, you know, the, the shock to oil prices, the shock to food uh, have moved into the core. But uh, the question is, if you looked at Thinking of about the the system, uh, the rate of increase of wages is a function of the rate of increase of prices, and the rate of increase of prices is a function of the rate of increase of wages. There are is that interdependence. You write down that system, you say is it explosive or is it dampening, and that is the critical question. So if it takes a few years, five percent, uh, we can live with it if it's reasonably predictable, and then it's going to go down. Uh, so the disin, and I said before, also is that there are asymmetries in adjustment. Prices go up more rapidly than they come down. Um, th that asymmetry in adjustment means that it may take longer for the prices to come down to normal than it took for prices to go up, for the inflation uh, to go up. So uh, the the question that we uh, have to ask is I think I think it's unambiguously that uh, if you look at the wage price dynamic there is not a spiral but it's it's coming down and the question that we have to ask is the cost of bringing it down faster versus the benefit and I think the cost can be very large. And when I say the cost, uh, cost to particular individuals, it's not, you know, the, the Fed likes to talk about, yes, there's a cost, there's going to be pain. He's not feeling the pain, that's for sure. But, or, except it, it may be if he has enough empathy, but there's not a lot of emphasis, uh, evidence of that. But, but uh, 
the pain, particularly to the poorest Americans uh, who already did very poorly in the pandemic. So if you put some weight on those distributional consequences, and by the way, I emphasize the hysteresis effects of, of the labor market, the unemployment are very significant. And so if you include those effects, I think the picture is pretty clear in my mind uh, that uh, um, using monetary policy as the main instrument is flawed. We should use more fiscal policy. If we think the labor market is tight, and I think the evidence is ambiguous, we ought to use some of the labor market policies that I described to expand the labor supply. Um, and if I were, and since I think the, those policies would be good thing in any case, I think we should go ahead and do that. That's what, if I were again, again, to answer the previous question about what I, if I were Powell, I would say very, but there are some things you could do in fiscal policy that will have long run benefits for our society. Um, that's it. Yeah. I think one more question. John University Thanks so much for your thoughts. We hear you again after many years. Um, you know, in thinking about about policy during the pandemic, you emphasize actually traditional macroeconomic aggregate output, inflation, yes, uh, distributional concerns. But but um, uh, it seems to me, thinking back, that uh, macro policy as well as micro policies were actually more oriented towards specifically the pandemic to infection, hospitalizations, and mortality. And so, for example, you seem critical of the higher UI benefits during the pandemic. No, I, I'm very supportive of them. <laughs> so many people were critical of high UI benefits during the uh, pandemic. Uh, saying they encourage uh, workers to uh, stay at home. And that's usually interpreted in a kind of more hazard sort of way. Um, you know, they're, they're taking leisure rather than working. But I think one of the explicit motivations for that policy was to get them to stay at home because of the externality that they go to work, they bring infection home to people in their households and their social network down. Right? But we actually have some evidence that that uh, from the UI changes in the summer of 2021. So I wonder, you know, maybe that should also be part of the discussion of that policy during the pandemic, because there are lessons that we need to learn for the next pandemic, which is never going to be. Yeah. No, I agree uh, that uh, the those public health effects are first order uh, in the midst of a pandemic, and, and they need to be uh, center stage in all policy, including macro policy. The results, I, I, I didn't give the full uh, analysis, of the large variation in UI across different states is very strongly uh, uh, suggestive that the increased UI did not lead to significant changes in uh, unemployment. It didn't have the effect that some people were worried about. Um, you know, it may have had in certain places, but the overall evidence is that the UI did not induce higher unemployment. But again, go back to uh, um, the general issue of the role of government here uh, and the lack of bargaining power of workers. I think OSHA should have taken a stronger uh, view. And uh, so there were two things that we should have done very clearly. We should have expanded paid sick leave. I don't know if you know the story of uh, what happened on that. We are the only country that does not have mandatory paid sick leave among the advanced countries. There's one other, but almost the only country. Um, and Congress discussed this and uh, the context was, we'll only do it for the pandemic, COVID-19. We don't want to, we don't want to make work, you know, just, we don't, we don't want to be like other countries. Well, uh, workers, if they're sick, they still have to go to work. But COVID-19, we're a little worried. Uh, so uh, 
had that discussion. And you know, the outcome was we exempted small businesses that we exempted big corporations said we can't afford this. And the outcome was that something like 84% of all workers were exempted from mandatory paid sick leave. And of course, that is exactly the kind of, you know, uh, they go to work and it spreads. But the uh, OSHA should have stepped in and said, okay, if they're going to go to work, at least you have to be masked. You have to have social distancing. But OSHA was, uh, didn't want to do anything. Um, here in New York, uh, you know, I knew people who working in grocery stores and said, you know, we, we need social distancing and masking. And uh, it was only because of the union that they were able to get those uh, worker protections. So that's an example where, you know, you can use direct measures to help protect public health when there's a public health crisis. And we didn't do that, unfortunately. I just given my my privilege as a as a host here, I ask you a very brief question. And I think with that we sort of finish. I'm not able to stop sharing or leaving this. I think that was it. But uh, so one of the issues that sort of appear in the pandemic is saying monetary policy in the United States is clearly wrong and it's not helping. Uh, but the kind of prejudice thing that I've seen in, in terms of developing countries, there is a fear of hiking interest rates when the U.S. is hiking them that has led to a sort of global depreciation of currencies. And those tend to be very inflationary. And when depreciations are high, resistance does happen and bargaining then plays a role. So there has been, I'm from Argentina, Argentina has 100% inflation, you know the case very well. So what is your take on those cases and what would be the right policy? So if you were the central base, if you were the president, if you were Martin Guzman and they put him as the president of the central bank in Argentina, what would you do? Yeah, uh, I, I, I would have a much harder time. And uh, one of the reasons that I'm so critical of the U.S. Fed is that it has this cross-border externality if you're the central banker in, in Argentina and mo many other countries where there is a high pass-through, uh, that is a imported prices get, uh, depreciation has, increases imported prices effectively and that increases inflation and you have higher wage price dynamics than we have in the United States, then I think you have very little choice but to uh, increase interest rates. So this is a case where uh, it's a further argument in my mind for the Fed uh, not increasing interest rates because it imposes very high costs because then these other countries have to raise their interest rates when their economic circumstances are very different and they get a real recession. So it's a huge cost that, that we impose uh, on uh, other countries. There's one country uh, whose central bank uh, and, uh, uh, is, uh, is, has a very different problem. I, I, I had a chance to uh, have a talk with him and that is Japan. He, uh, he was headed by a good economist. Uh, and I, I think again, there's a good economist heading it. Um, but, but uh, as you know, Japan uh, has had a long period, almost 20 years of deflation. And so uh, they were worried that deflation also has a negative effect on the economy. And they want, they've been pushing to get inflation. Their goal was to get inflation up to two or 3%. And they finally have succeeded. I think the inflation got up to 2.8%. So for them, this is a celebration. And so he's resisted increasing the interest rates uh, because actually uh, what, what he's getting is good for the Japanese economy. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for those that were still in Zoom. Uh, the, the